Amen. If uh, you love the Lord today, give God a hand clap of praise in this house. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time as we go to the altar and seek the face of our God in these trying times. I believe God is not only able, but I believe God is willing to not only hear our prayers, but to answer our prayers. There's a lot of things going on in the lives of so many people. The Bible says if we will call upon the name of the Lord, we faint not. Don't be weary in well-doing, because in due season you shall reap. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ, for another privilege and opportunity to come together on this first Sunday of December 2016. We are privileged, God, to be here today because we acknowledge first and foremost our unworthiness. We've not lived well enough to deserve to be here today. We've not kept all of your commandments and lived according to your word well enough, God, to merit the opportunity to stand, to kneel, and to sit before your presence today. Despite our shortcomings, God, you have been good to us. You've literally been better to us than we deserve. And so we join hands and hearts today in this, your house, this, your sanctuary, to express our gratitude and to say thank you for all of your goodness. We thank you, God, for your son, our Savior, Jesus the Christ, who hung, bled, and died, was buried and risen on our behalf, who literally, God, has become the atonement for our sins, that precious lamb, that sacrifice, oh God, that helped us to be reconciled unto you and to be made one with you again. We give you praise for Jesus, for we realize that it's in him that we live, we move, and have our being. We thank you, God, that he sits on your right hand, interceding on our behalf. And we thank you, God, for the presence of your Holy Spirit today, who not only comforts us, but guides us and teaches us, brings to remembrance all those things that you have imparted into us. We come today, God, to worship you in spirit and in truth. Many of us here today have gone through various difficult days and trying times this past week. But yet, God, you've allowed us to be here. So let us not allow our coming to be in vain. But let us be mindful of the fact that because you've been good to us, that, God, you are worth our worship this morning. Let us not refrain our tongues from lifting you up. Let us not be afraid or ashamed, God, to express our love and affection for you because, God, that's how good you've really been to us. You've brought us through every trial. You've taken us over every mountain. God, you've kept us through every valley. God, you've made a way out of no way. God, you've been a friend when friends have abandoned us. You've been family members, God, when our family couldn't understand us. God, you, you've been all that we need and, and everything, God. So we pause today just to say thank you for who you are. You've been a friend. You've been a shelter over the storms. And we give you praise today. And we thank you, God. So as we come together, I pray, God, that where we've sinned and come short of your glory, that you would purge us and cleanse us. For we realize, God, you won't dwell in an unclean place. And so if there's any iniquity, any sin in our hearts, any all against each other, God, help us to clear our slate, God, that, that we might be able to feel your presence, that we might be able to experience your might and your miraculous works in our lives today. Touch, oh God. Reconcile those who have been divided. Restore relationships. Bless the single person, God, that, that person that appears to be hungry for love and seeking in all the wrong places. Let that person understand, God, if they wait on you. They've got to learn how to be satisfied within themselves. That couple, God, that is struggling just to get along day by day. Grant them the peace of Christ. 
Help them, oh God, to walk in the humility of Jesus Christ and to swallow their pride and to do what is right before your presence. Those who are struggling financially, God, those who are battling with some illness, oh God, intercede on their behalf, oh God. Show yourself strong. Show yourself mighty among your people that we might be able to testify of your goodness, that we might share with the glory, the, the world the glory of our God and the, and, the, and the power of your might, that when we go to our jobs, we might declare that you are God and you're God all by yourself. When we're riding down the street, God, we might not trust in our vehicles, in our engines, in our, in our batteries, but in the, in the power of your presence, oh God, to guide us and to navigate us safely across dangerous streets and highways. When we lie down at night, we might lie down not because our security, our alarms on, but because we know you got an angel dispatched over our behalf that's watching over us day and night. God, if you'd be good to us, we'd be, we'll be careful to declare your glory. To let the world know that you are our God. So heal us, oh God. Deliver us, oh God. Save us, oh God. Restore us, oh God. Transform us. Make us whole, oh God. And we'll be careful to give you na your name the praise. Your name the honor. And your name the glory. God, we ask it in Jesus' name our Lord and our Christ. And the church said amen. Amen, amen. amen. Give somebody a hug. Let them know that God loves them and so do you. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How pleasant it is for brothers and sisters to come together. Amen.
Amen, amen. amen. Have you put it all in his hands? Amen. amen. We just left the altar, so hopefully you did put it all in his hands. Amen. amen. At this time, we'd like to recognize any first-time guests. If this is your first time visiting with us here at First Baptist, we'd like for you to please stand. Amen. So glad you came out. And one more time, First Baptist, let's really, really show her some love the First Baptist way. Thank you.
Good morning, First Baptist. How many is glad to be here this morning? Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Come on, he woke you up this morning. He started you on your way. You owe him. Come on, somebody. One of the things my grandmother taught me as a kid growing up, it is so impolite that when someone does something for you and you don't have the decency to say thank you. But when I think about the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords who took out of his time, if there is such, to open my eyes each waking day, despite what's going on in the world today, despite what's going on with the economy, despite what's going on in our nation and in our world, yet God continues and remains to be good. Old folks said he's been better to me. You know the rest. Come on, let's give God praise in this house this morning like we realize God is good. Come on. How many realize it was down at the cross where your eyes came open? Where you realize your weakness and your vulnerability, your weaknesses and your faults and your failures. But yet it was at the cross, at the cross where I first saw the light. And the birth. I feel good this morning. I don't know about you, but I, I come to worship because the enemy didn't want me to be here. But I'm here and I'm going to give it to him. Come on, somebody. Down at the cross. Come on.
when I was walking in the When I was down and out Oh, yes it is, yes it is Oh, oh, oh. He met me When I needed peace He met me When I needed help He met me I'm so glad he met me. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. When all else fails, the Lord has a way of showing up on your behalf. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Christ, for the opportunity and the privilege to worship you in spirit and in truth. Now, God, as we delve into your word, we confess our inability to teach or learn without you. So have thine own way. Speak into our lives, speak through us, into us, and help us, O oh God, to become what you would have us to be, and that which you have ordained for us through your son, Jesus Christ. We ask for the forgiveness of our sins, for the presence and the anointing of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. If you give me a little more volume, if you would. Thank you so much. Good morning, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Praise God. It's good to see so many of you out this morning. We thank God for all of you. We thank God for our ministers, our deacons, our uh, ushers, our, those in audiovisual, our choir and the music department, and all of you who are here today to celebrate Christ and to lift up the name of Jesus. We're so thankful that God has allowed us to be here one more time in his house. And as we prepare to go into the word and continue our theme for the year, Total Fitness for Jesus Christ and his kingdom, I pray that you will uh, um, take heed to the word of God. 
I was thinking this morning, you know, the purpose of preaching is twofold. Uh, first, there's proclamation, and that is so that people might get saved, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ so that those who don't believe will believe and become Christians. The second goal of Christianity is to make disciples. That is from proclamation to explanation. That is expounding the scripture so that we can grow in Christ and become everything that God intends for us to be. So it's one thing to get saved. It's another thing to be developed and matured into the Christian that God wants you to be. And that just doesn't come with a shout. That comes with substance. And, uh, and so we encourage you to get into the word and let the word get into you because if, if you allow that to take place, the word will literally transform your life. And so with that thought in mind, I want to invite your attention uh, to 1 Peter, the third chapter, verse 11. Is that a feed? Y'all getting some feedback? Does that sound like a feedback? Yes. Getting a little feedback right now, yeah. Uh, I'm struggling with a little cold, too. It might be my Barry, Barry White voice. I don't know. I... <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. We also want to thank God for those who are streaming live and those who will hear us by way of radio. And as we always say, we are streaming live is not to stay home, uh, but for those who uh, are homebound, are traveling, and uh, they want to tune in with us, so we encourage you to do so. In First Peter, the third chapter, beginning at verse 10, it says... For he who would love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips that they speak no guile. Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Let's look at that from the New Living Translation for the sake of clarity. For the scripture says, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days. How many folk want to see many happy days? Keep your tongue <laughs> from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Amen. And that's going to help us today because some of y'all said, if I just had a man, if I just had more money, if I had a bigger house, I would be happy. What the Bible says, if you keep your mouth from saying certain things and stop lying, you're going to be happy. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. <laughs> before, I put the, before I put our title up there, I just want to kind of give a brief introduction, and I'll let them know when to put the title up there. But one of the most uh, mind-blowing and fascinating things uh, that I find fascinating about the Internet and social media is that it immediately opens you up and exposes you to the entire world at the click of a button. I mean, it's amazing whether it's good or bad, negative or positive, either way, we are now able to see things and hear things that at one time would have been hidden, that would have probably caused many of us to doubt, and in many cases, it would have been held incognito uh, around the world. But social media literally connects you uh, to people and things that 40 to 50 years ago you would not have imagined connecting to. Am I right? Uh, you, you couldn't have been privy to it, and even if someone had shared it with you, you would have been reluctant to believe it, uh, uh, the things that you can now witness via social media. Because social media is the new wave of communication that not only exposes you to the world, but it also invites you to participate in becoming one with the world and in joining the world in doing those things that the world participates in. And such is the case with many of the most recent challenges that we have seen across this globe. The challenge, one in particular, 
And I think about some of the challenges, it's, it's amazing to me, some of the challenges that people participate in because oftentimes many of them are not only foolish, but dangerous. You know, kind of like the cinnamon challenge. You know, the cinnamon of taking a spoon of cinnamon and swallowing it within 60 seconds without drinking anything just to show that you can do it and not thinking about the, how it can damage your throat and how detrimental it could be to your health and welfare. But people all across the globe have been taking this so-called cinnamon challenge. Some of y'all might remember the ice bucket challenge. You know, that was for a charitable purpose that where they would pour a bucket of ice on you. And uh, people all over the globe, uh, Christians and non-Christians alike, uh, participated in what was called the ice bucket challenge. There's another challenge that I thought was quite absurd, and that is the fire challenge. The fire challenge is a challenge where you pour your alcohol all over yourself and then light a flame and expose it on Facebook. I mean, just some stupid stuff. <laughs> you got the, and I, and I don't really keep up with entertainers, but it's the, the, the Cali Jenner challenge. That is, if I, if I got her name right, uh, the, what is it? Kaylee? Kaylee Jenner? Okay, somebody say Kylie, somebody say Kaylee. We're going to go in between. Okay, so <laughs> the Jenner challenge. Now watch this. It's the lip challenge. And that's, and that's where they, they, they literally are uh, uh, trying to recreate the puffy lips uh, on television star. And the internet users uh, show themselves using a small vessel like a shot glass that covers their lips, drawing all the air out of the vessel. And then releasing, which is temporarily puffs the lips by drawing the user's blood into them. This activity is considered harmful both for bruising and disfiguration of the lips and the potential for the vessel to shatter and cut the person. And then you got what was called the Charlie Charlie Challenge. This was, <laughs> this was a challenge that was across social media that uh, they had to do something like the Ouija board. And it's a ritual which is the spirit of a fictitious Mexican demon uh, named Charlie is invoked by way of two pencils in the shape of a cross, the word yes and no, and written on paper in a square. And then social media users begin circulating videos of the pencils moving uh, to the word yes when asked if the demon is present. And basically, the internet and social media has opened and exposed people of every ethnicity and nationality to all types of things. And there are some that's less harmful, some challenges. One was the book bucket challenge. I don't think too many people heard of that one. That, that was a challenge that was given in August to September 2014, where the uh, original ice bucket challenge evolved from. Uh, the book bucket challenge invokes people to share the names of 10 books that inspired them on their social networking pages or donating books to the needy and sharing those photos with friends in social networking. And then, most recently, there was the mannequin challenge where everybody with a little music in the background and somebody videoing them, everybody wants to see how still, how they can remain, look like mannequins. Uh, some have done extremely well, and some have proven they need to keep their day jobs. <laughs> <laughs> However, I have another challenge for you today. As we go back to this particular passage of scripture, and we look at 1 Peter, the third chapter. It says, he who will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil. Let him keep his lips from speaking guile 
and let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. I want to talk about God's biblical tongue challenge for a happy life. God's biblical tongue challenge for a happy life. Or God's word challenge for a happy life. We talked on last week about learning how to exercise our tongues for a better life or for the purpose of life. And today I want to talk about God's challenge for a happy life. Let me begin by suggesting this, that happiness is a choice. And the first thing that Peter points out in this text, he's writing to a group of believers and Christians who are under persecution, severe persecution. He's writing this letter to exhort and to encourage them to maintain a certain conduct and behavior regardless of what they're going through. And we need to understand that our happenings should not determine our happiness. That is to say that what we go through and how long we go through it and what we have to endure and what we have to put up with should not determine whether you and I are capable of exhibiting genuine happiness or not. Because what Jesus tells us in John 10 and 10 is that the thief comes not but for to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and life more abundantly. And so we need to understand that within God's word, within the confines of God's word, God challenges us that we will take his word uh, at face value and learn how to live a happy life regardless of how bad things may seem. And so the first challenge that he gives us is the challenge, watch this, to love life and to choose happiness. He, he tells us, he says, he who will love life and see good days, let him. Now notice you'll notice in that text, he says, let him three times, let him, first of all, refrain his tongue from evil, let him turn away from evil, let him seek uh, peace and pursue peace. In other words, the word let uh, suggests that it is our choice for us to be happy or unhappy. We can say other people caused it, and this is so important during this time of the year because we call this time the happy holidays, the happy time of the year, and so many people are saddened by certain things that are transpiring in their lives, and I stop by to tell somebody that the best way to have a good Christmas, the best way to have a happy holiday is to learn how to be happy within yourself, not based upon what's happening outside of you. He says, if you want to see good days, if you want to love life, if you really want to be happy, he says, let, let, let. In other words, choose it. Because in Deuteronomy, the 30th chapter, verse 19, the Bible says, I set before you a, 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 a life and death Watch this, he says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I've set before you life and death, blessings and cursings, therefore do what? Choose. Choose life. In other words, God says, I've put two paths before you. In one path, there's life. In another path, there's death. In one path, there's cursings. In another path, there's, uh, there's blessings. But here's what I'm gonna do for you. I'm gonna instruct you on which path to take, but I will not take it for you and I will not make you take it. Which means the happiness and the joy or the sadness and the gloom that you and I experience is not because of life, it's not because of others, it's not because God is angry at us, it's because we've chosen it. God says I've set before you two paths. Choose life, but you've got the right as a free will agent to choose death. You've got a right to choose sadness. You've got a right to choose negativity. He says, but I'm going to tell you, you've got a right to choose cursing. But he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to learn how to choose life. Because life, every day you wake up, life and death is standing before you. 
Now, he's not just talking about physical life. He's talking about those things that when you think of life and death, as we talked about last week, the, the, uh, the, the death implies those things that are negative. Those things, when you think of someone dying, you're saddened by it. When you think of someone dying, it, it's, 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 a, it's a matter of loneliness. You're separated. All the things that are associated with death, he says you can choose that, or you can choose those things that are associated with life, happiness and joy and peace and prosperity, or you can choose sadness and gloom and being down and depressed, but it's all a choice. Because right here, Peter says to us, he who would love life, in other words, if you desire it, if you really, really want it, then choose it. Quit expecting somebody else to make you happy. Don't get married so somebody else can make you happy. Because if you are a negative, sad person, can't nobody make you a positive, happy person. That is something you've got to learn how to do on your own. And so, and so this is a challenge that, watch this, indicates a direction of the wheel. That is to say, you and I must will to be happy. Things are falling apart. People are walking out of my life. Things are not going well on the job, but I choose. Are you with me today? I choose to be happy and, and, and to see joy and the best in everything. See, it's one thing to quote Romans 8 and 28, all things work together for the good of them that love the Lord and call the according to his birth. That sounds good, but how do you conduct yourself when the, birth, when the worst comes instead of the best? See, the challenge to love life and to choose happiness, in fact, the Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 11 and 12, Paul talks about this when he says, I've learned how to be abased, I've learned how to abound, and I've learned how to be content in whatever state I find myself in. When I'm free, I'm happy, but when I'm incarcerated, I'm happy. See, that when I'm broke, I'm happy, but when I'm not broke, I'm happy. In other words, my happiness is not contingent on what's happening. And too often Christians have perfected acting like they have it all together instead of learning how to be happy by choice. And many of us have been deceived to believe that if we pray to God, God will make us happy. God will not make you happy. God has given you the resources and he's given you the ingredients like we talked about on Wednesday night, uh, the, the recipe for happiness. God has given you a re recipe for happiness. But if you don't put the ingredients in there, if you don't follow the instructions, it won't come out like it's supposed to be. And so the challenge to love and to choose happiness. See, God's word challenge to us today is to, to love life. Why? Because you only have it one time. You don't get a second go round. And so learn how to love life. And this word love does not just mean to fall in love with the things of this world. It means in a social or moral sense, if you will. In other words, the word love comes from a, a Greek word, agapeo. And in this word, it literally ind indicates, as I put up there, a, a direction of the wheel. That is to say, I choose to love my life. I choose to love who I am. I choose to love where I am in life. I may not be where I want to be, but I choose to be thankful for where I am. See, that way I don't get up every morning down. I don't get up every morning saddened by situations and circumstances. It doesn't matter where I am. As long as I know who's with me, I'm happy wherever I am. And so therefore, it doesn't matter if I'm by myself during the holidays. Because I tell you, everybody who's got somebody ain't happy during the holidays. <laughs> Just keep looking straight ahead, keep don't, don't, let, don't let the season fool you. And to make you to believe just being hooked up with somebody gonna make you feel better. There's a possibility who you hooked up with might make you feel worse. May get on your last nerve. <laughs> There are folk hooked up with people right now that wish they were single again. And I'm not suggesting that, that we ought to not preach. I'm just saying learn how to be happy wherever you are. In fact, the Bible tells you if you're married, don't seek to be unmarried. 
If you're single, don't seek to be married. Learn how to be satisfied with life where you are. Because that's really what it talks about when it says to love life. When he says right here, he says, and, uh, he who will love life, that is a, a, to be blessed and to be satisfied. Not everything I want, but I'm satisfied. Not where I really want to be in life, but I'm satisfied. Not always getting everything I want, every day I want it, when I want it, with who I want it, but I'm satisfied. Is there anybody in the house today that can say in the name of Jesus, I'm satisfied? I ain't got to have a house like everybody else. I don't have to drive what everybody else drives. I don't have to dress like everybody else. I'm just grateful for what the Lord has done for me. Is there anybody in the house that can say, God, I'm thankful for what you've done for me? Just satisfied. Happy. And I love folk when I see folk who smile all the time. Sometimes you think something's wrong with them, but they're just happy. <laughs> the, the first challenge I want to give you during this holiday season is the challenge to love life, not the season. Not the toys, not the trees. It's all right to have all that. But to love life. You've got one life. Live and cherish every moment you have. You can't go back and get yesterday. And don't waste your days in misery. Love it. Socially, morally, get the best out of it. Because you only get one chance at it. Let me just inject here for the younger people. Learn from those who's already been what you're going through because you can save yourself some troubles. Amen. Don't think just because they older, they don't know any better. What has been shall be. There's nothing new under the sun. What you're going through, we've been through, and what you're going through, somebody else gonna go through. There's nothing, come on, talk to me somebody. There's nothing new under the sun. And so, so learn how to love life and Choose having to see good days, good days that are, that are filled with blessedness. And, and here's a good way to be happy and to be blessed. Make somebody else happy. See, the best way to be blessed and to be happy is to go out of your way to bless somebody else and make somebody, because if you bless them, you'll be blessed. In fact, the Bible tells us in Luke 6 and 38, it says, give and it shall be given, not just money. Give and it shall be given, pressed down, shaken together. Shall men give into your bosom, running over again. In other words, the Bible says if you give it out, it'll come back to you. Ecclesiastes 11 and 1 says, cast your bread upon the waters, and after many days it'll come back. In other words, if you show love, love will come back to you. If you choose life, choose to be happy. Quit frowning so much. It takes more muscles to frown than to smile. Remember at all times, regardless of who you angry at, the devil is behind the scene and what the devil wants to do is destroy you. You blaming the other person, but the devil is saying, I'm destroying you while you blaming that person. You the one that's waking up miserable. You the one that's going throughout the day sad. You the one that's trying to fake it till you make it. You the one that acts like you got it all together, but deep down on the inside you're killing yourself. He says, no, stop it. Choose life. And choose to be happy. The second challenge I want to give you is the challenge to control your tongue from speaking evil and lies. And notice, I didn't say that. This is what the Bible said. This is God's word and God's word challenge for us today. He says, if you want to see good days and love life, refrain your tongue from evil and quit lying. <laughs> now, now, one of the scriptures we used on last week was uh, Proverbs 18.21. Death and life are in the power of your tongue, 
and they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. We talked about what death was, pestilence and sickness and, and all those things that are negative in life, vitality and prosperity and all those things that are good. And he said those things are in your tongue. So, so what Peter is saying as he piggybacks off of Psalm 34 in, in verses 11 and 12, he's simply saying here that if you want to see good days, if you want to learn how to love life, he says refrain. Notice the word he used. He didn't just talk about speaking. He says learn how to refrain your tongue. See, some of us think it makes us big or it shows how grown we are or how big and tough we are when we speak what we feel. But what the Bible is saying, that if you want to be wise and if you want to enjoy life, don't speak what you feel. Speak or learn how to refrain your tongue. Because everything we say is not for our benefit. And oftentimes what we say is to our detriment. And so he said, so learn how to speak life and not death. Speak life. In other words, refrain. What does it mean to refrain? How many of y'all ever felt like saying something? He said, hold it back, hold it back, hold that. Put, put, put that bright on the, just hold, pull it back. Because I know what you feel like saying at times. But he said, just pull that, pull that tongue back into perspective and say, not right now. See, see, he says, refrain your tongue from evil. Now, there are several types of evil. You know, the Bible talks about, I think I got a couple of scriptures up there. The Bible talks about in, in uh, Proverbs 10, and 19, I look at Proverbs 29, 11, that's one. Proverbs 29, 11, let's kind of go to it. A fool utters, what? Girl, I'm gonna tell them what I'm thinking. I'm telling you, he got to know all my mind. <laughs> now, a fool utters all his mind, but a wise person keeps it into afterwards. Now, that's not suggesting you can't speak. But it does suggest you got to know when to speak, how to speak. You got to be timely with this thing. It's not always what you say, but it's oftentimes how you say it, when you say it. So he's saying, don't just be a fool and utter all your mind. Learn to refrain your tongue and wait for the appropriate time. A lot of relationships will last a lot longer and be a lot happier if we learn how to zip the lip. So, y'all might want to write that one down. <laughs> Just zip the lip. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Proverbs 10, 19. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. Do that in the New Living Translation so they can understand it a little bit better, please. Watch this. Too much talk leads to sin. <laughs> Y'all understand that, don't you? <laughs> the more you talk, the more likely it is you're going to mess up. Be sensible and keep your mouth I love this scripture. <laughs> Until I'm guilty of it. <laughs> but watch this. It says, if you want to see, enjoy life and see good days, enjoy your holidays, enjoy every day, he says, speak life and not death, speak wisely and not foolishly. But then thirdly, he tells us something else. He said to speak words that edify and extend the grace of God. Notice, if you will, in Proverbs 15 and 1, a soft answer turns away wrath. But grievous words, which means the more you talk, the, the more heat is going to develop, the more fire that's going to be kindled. So he says a soft answer. When you holler, guess what? They're going to holler back. When you cuss, they're going to cuss back. So he says, you turn that thing around. A soft answer turns away anger. You know, it used to be said only a fool can argue by themselves. And you put the fire out when you refuse to argue back. Yeah, in fact, I believe I have not met, I can't remember anybody personally, but I, there are some people who get upset with you because you won't argue with them. 
You don't even know how to argue right. <laughs> just get an attitude about anything. Just, you, know, you don't even know how to fuss right. I mean, what kind of relationship is this? Uh, <laughs> the challenge to control your tongue from speaking evil, but not only speaking like that, because notice, in, I think it's in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, when it talks about evil communication corrupts good manners. And so it literally corrupts you. And then I think it's in, in Numbers, the 13th chapter, when the Bible says that the children of Israel, when they were complaining, God called it evil. Because God calls not only speaking words, uh, uh, vulgar words, and, and doing some of the stuff we do, but he says to complain is evil. Why? Because God is good to us. And so every time we complain, we need to learn how to repent. Because, in fact, I, I was sharing some time ago that we need to take some of our young people and some of our older people to some of these third world countries because we're spoiled over. We just don't realize how good we have it. And when you realize what other people don't have and the meager means by which they have to live, it helps you to develop a sense of appreciation for everything that you have. Speak words that edify. Watch this in Ephesians 4.29. I want you to read this with me because it helps us understand that God has called us to build each other up. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good. To the use of edifying, the word edifying means to build up. Now here's what this verse says. If it's not helpful, don't say it. You see that? Don't engage in conversations or gossip. If it's not going to build somebody up, if it's not going to edify them, if it's not going to lift them up to a level of, of a betterment in their lives, he says keep your mouth shut. And why? that it may minister grace to the hearers. And one of the reasons we ought to do it is because of the grace that God has bestowed on us. See, nobody likes to be torn down. And so, and so if you don't like for folk to talk about you negatively, don't talk about anybody else negatively. It's simple. But we make it complex because Jesus says there's only two major laws. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Whatever you don't want anybody to do to you, don't do it to anybody else. And whatever you would like for people to do to you, I say to you, do it for somebody else. Grace, unmerited favor. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of building people up. So that it may minister grace to the hero. Now watch this, even if the person is wrong or done you wrong, it says you don't allow evil communication or corrupt communication come out of your mouth, but speak words that build up so that the person who's done you wrong might receive the grace. Don't be vindictive, let that person receive the grace and let them know that you forgive them. Let them know that you understand we all fall short of the glory of God and learn how to live life and enjoy every moment of it by building one another because what will happen if you build them up eventually they'll build you up because none of us stay at the top. Every one of us in one point or another in our lives needs somebody to give us a word of encouragement. I don't care how many Bible verses you know it can quote. I don't care how long you have a position in the church. You need somebody to give you an encouraging word. But let me say this while that comes to my mind. Not only do you need somebody to give you an encouraging word, but for those who receive encouraging words, no matter how angry you are, you need to learn how to receive them. Because what happens sometimes, persons go out of their way to humble themselves and do what's necessary to bring about reconciliation, and then you won't receive it. Don't give space to the devil. Don't even give place to him. Because by doing so, he will get in again. And his goal is to keep you separated, keep you sad, keep you divided. God's goal is to show you how to live in peace, how to be happy at all times. I know it's a simple sermon, but it's true anyhow. The third challenge I want to give you is the challenge to turn away from the very appearance of evil. I want to talk about this. Romans 12, 17 through 21. 
learning to shun the very appearance of evil. A lot of Christians get tripped up because we engage ourselves in stuff we ain't got no business engaging in. Look at, look at Romans, the 12th chapter, if you will. Let's look, at, uh, look that up. You should know when something is not good for you. Recompense to no man evil for evil. They did you wrong. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lies within you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself, but rather give place unto the wrath, uh, wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says who? The Lord. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, do what? If your enemy is thirsty, for in doing so you shall heap coals of fire on his head. And verse 21, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing what? So, so turn from the very appearance of evil. For instance, if you know drinking will cause you to stumble, don't associate yourself with folk who are drinking. Turn from it. Let me say this to, to married folk. You're on your job and somebody's consistently hitting on you, male or female, and you know you're married, but things are not well at home. Don't just sit there and listen to that mess. Turn from it. Know that it's not those persons, it's the enemy using those persons because the goal of the enemy is to make you fall. The person who's hitting on you is obviously already falling. So the goal is to get you jacked up, to get you messed up. So that person is whispering in your ear. You know, I, I don't understand why your, your spouse don't love you. If I was your spouse and I, you ain't. Just simple as that. And so you got to learn to turn from me for those that are single. Asley brothers came to my mind. Between the sheets. If you know you single and you're not married, you ain't got no bed in between the sheets with nobody else. Get you a teddy bear. Keep yourself clean. Get you a little pillow or something and hold it, you know. You ain't Let me. I'm just trying to show you how to, how to avoid the very appearance of evil. Amen. Turn away. The Bible says, I didn't say that. I put the teddy bear thing in there, but, but the Bible said, turn away from the very appearance if it looks like it's going to mess you up. If it feels like it might trip you up, get away from it. When the Lord speaks to your mind and it start, your heart starts palpitating and, and fluttering, leave. Do like Joseph, do run. Because the enemy wants to destroy you. It says abstain from all appearance. Even if it's not evil, if it just look evil. You know, somebody walk up to you, they just look evil, say, no, nah, no, nah, no, nah, I'm done with this, no. <laughs> nah, you don't even look right, no. <laughs> I hope I'm... Hope I'm helping somebody. <laughs> Finally, the last challenge is the challenge to look for peace and to pursue peace. Watch this in all things. He who will love life and see good days, let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil, avoid it, and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. Why? Because the Lord's eyes are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those that do evil. And those scriptures that I give you simply suggest that you and I are to pursue peace at all costs. The Bible tells us in Romans that it's not always possible to be at peace with some people. But the scripture says as much as it lies within you, 
as much as it is your responsibility, you be at peace with all people. Why? Because the Lord is watching you. And so it's not just so you can feel good. And it's not just so that you can say you've done the right thing. But your whole motive behind keeping this text and this word is because you know the Lord's eyes are upon you. And the scripture says, here's what's, what's happening. He's not just watching us, but when we're obedient to his words, the Bible says he will hear our prayers. That is to say, because he's watching us and seeing how we will handle every situation, he says, I'm seeing if you're going to do good or evil. I'm seeing if you're going to refrain your tongue from evil. I'm seeing if you're going to pursue peace, because if you do it, then not only am I watching you, I'm going to bless you. When you pray and call on my name, I will incline my ear unto you. When you seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Then I will forgive your sin. And then I will heal the land. I don't know about you, but I made up in my mind that I'm going to choose life. I'm going to choose to be happy. Is there anybody in the house today that can say starting today, I don't care whether I'm single or married. I don't care whether I'm rich or broke. I don't care what's going on, friend or friendless. I've decided I've got a friend that sticks closer than a brother, and his name is Jesus. And as long as I got Jesus, I got everything I need. As long as I got Jesus, I've got everything I need. And so don't be sad. Don't be depressed. Don't be down. Don't be in despair. Lift up your head for the Lord is with you. The Lord has smiled on you. The Lord woke you up this morning. The Lord started you on another day's journey. The Lord gave you health and strength. The Lord's been good to you. You got shelter over your head. You got food on your tables. And so learn how to love life. See the best out of every day. And what is bad, take the bad and turn it into good. And give God some praise by glorifying him. Because one of the things that the text teaches us is that in doing so, we magnify or edify our brothers, but we glorify our God. When we do right, God gets glory. And that's why Matthew 5, 16 says, let your light so shine so that others might see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. God wants you to live a happy life. Now, he's not going to say happiness based on all the material things. Happiness based on wherever you find yourself in life. Learn how to be happy. Learn how, because if you're happy, you can help other people become happy. It's hard to be positive or be negative and make somebody else or share a positive word with somebody else. It's hard to be down and make somebody else feel good about themselves. And so learn how to be happy at all times because God has a purpose and a plan that's much bigger than you. And that's why he sent his son into this world. That's why Christ come, not just so that we can go to heaven, but so that you can learn how to live life now. Heaven does not start when you get to the kingdom. Heaven starts now. The Bible says in Ephesians, God has already seated us in heavenly places. And so that's your inheritance. That's your heritage. You are rich in Christ. And you ought to lift up your head and live like such. Tell yourself every morning, I'm a child's king. I'm a, king of, I'm a child of the king, and, and, and the Lord is my strength. Doesn't matter what happens to me. I'm going to be all right. Let us stand in the presence of the Lord. Now, a lot of y'all did the mannequin challenge. I want you to join me in God's word challenge for a happy life. Learn to be happy with the person you're with. I hear one amen. Learn to be happy. <laughs> Let us pray. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your word. And we give you praise. And while we are able to laugh and have fun and enjoy your word, we pray, God, that we would take serious your word. To understand, God, that as we look into the passages of Scripture that you have given us as a manual for life, they only become a reality and they only work when we exercise them according to your word. 
Help us to swallow our pride, to get rid of our egos, to humble ourselves before your presence and the presence of others, to not give place unto the devil, but to learn how to make every day a happy day. And those times that we find ourselves in reality, struggling, battling the issues of life, let us not find ourselves uh, basking in depression, but do whatever it takes to get out, whether we're talking to somebody else or getting some aid or some assistance from somebody else, but to know, God, that you've raised us above that and that you've not called us to be under the circumstances, but to live above the circumstances. So bless your people now, God. Impart within us the power of your Holy Spirit to do those things that you've ordained for us to do and to not just live life for ourselves, but to learn how to live life for you and for others. And in doing so, God, we will experience the true fruit of happiness, joy, and peace. In Jesus' name, amen. There might be somebody here today who has not accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. If that's you today, we want to encourage you to come because there's no real joy, no real happiness outside of him who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who is the purpose of life and the creator of life. So if you've not accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, as the choir leads us in a song of invitation, would you make a decision to come, man, woman, boy, or girl? Maybe you want to rededicate your life. Maybe you want to give your life to Christ for the first time. I'll be restored to a right relationship with him. Would you come today? If you don't have a church home, and the Lord is saying this is where you need to come. You're already saved. You've already been baptized. But you don't have a family to call your own. And God is saying this is where I want you to become family. Would you follow the Spirit and be obedient to the Spirit and come? Man, woman, boy, girl. Maybe you need somebody to pray with you or pray for you. If that's you today, why don't you come? Don't be afraid, don't wait for somebody else. Would you come today, Ray, dedicate your life, be restored, come for the first time, amen, amen. Might be someone else. Why don't you make a decision today? I'm a living witness. It is possible to live a happy life. Doesn't mean everything always happens as you want, but you can be happy at all times. But that comes by the power of God and through the Spirit of God. And if you don't have it, come on, to Christ. If you don't have that kind of joy, if you don't have that kind of peace, why don't you come to Christ now? Give yourself to Him. Say, God, I want that kind of peace that I can enjoy that surpasses all understanding. I want that joy that's not contingent on what I go through or what I've experienced in life. I want that kind of peace of mind that even in the midst of trouble, I can still find joy. I can still find laughter. I can still be helpful to somebody else. If that's you today, if you're not, if you're not there today, why don't you come? God wants you to experience that. A brand new life. All you got to do is come. Just come to Christ. Amen. Let's give God a hand clap of praise for his goodness. And if you did not come and desired to come, there are some cars in front of the pews uh, that you're sitting in and those pews that are in front of you, and you can fill out those and put them in with the offering tray when we take up our offering. At this time, we're preparing to uh, be obedient to the word of the Lord who says do this as, oft as often as we do it, do it in remembrance of him. And Jesus hung, bled, and died for us, was buried and risen. And as we reflect back upon what he had done and the crucifixion and the pain and the su suffering and shame that he had to go through, let us look back, but also let us look forward to his coming again. For the Bible says he will come back again for a church without spot or wrinkle. So let us pray. Father, we come before you thanking you in the name of Jesus for this opportunity to share together one with another. We realize, God, that we've sinned and come short of your glory in many different ways. So God, we repent right now of every sin, every iniquity, every transgression, every evil thought, every idle word, every wicked deed done in our bodies so that we will not eat damnation unto ourselves. 
So as we come together, help us to come together as a unified body in obedience to your word. We ask asking God you bless the bread that sanctified, that symbolizes the body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Bless its juice that symbolizes the blood that was shed for the remission of our sins. And then bless us, O oh God, as we come together to do what you've commanded us to do. And we pray, God, that your spirit will be among us and that your will will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. The body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Bible said when Jesus was in the upper room, he took the bread, said that it was his body, broke it, blessed it, said eat y'all of it. He took the cup, lifted it up, blessed it, said drink y'all of it. The scripture says they departed by singing a hymn, and uh, we'll depart going to our Sunday morning classes, but before we do so, we got a couple of brief announcements before we take up the offering. Baby dedication will be done on uh, December the 18th. And uh, so we're gonna have baby dedication on the 18th of December. For those of you that wanna have your uh, newborn babies dedicated unto the Lord. Also the children's Christmas program will be also on December the 18th during the Sunday school hour. And so uh, we're asking that you be a part of that as we come out and uh, participate with our youth. And then all members are asked to fill out a 2017 ministry team form uh, if you plan to serve on any ministry in 2017. We really need some volunteers. And uh, I've been talking to a lot of pastors across the country. And one of the things that's happened is a decline in volunteerism across this country. I mean, white, black, and alike. And so uh, we're asking that you will understand that when God saved you, God saved you to serve. 
And so we need people to be committed. We really need you to get committed, not only inside the church, but also outside the church. And so uh, you're asked to do this, even if you are currently serving in that ministry. Time has been extended to next Sunday to turn in the forms uh, to Brother Juan Robinson, our sister Barbara Williams. One of them will be in the music room after the 8 a.m. service and the 11 a.m. service. And if you don't know who that is and you don't do that, at least drop it in the uh, uh, offering tray and it will get to the right persons. Um, and so make sure that we govern ourselves according. Also, there's another uh, video that we want to uh, show you real quickly, and then we'll take up our offering and we'll be on our way to our classes. Amen. Straight out of Hollywood. Y'all pray for our acting skills. We hadn't gotten there yet, so we working on it, though. At this time, we're going to prepare to take up our offering. As we know, the Lord has uh, blessed us and commanded us to give uh, cheerfully and generously. Let's continue to pray for all of those who are sick and shut in, those who have had death in their families. But we realize God has been good to us, and so he wants us to uh, express it, not only in our lifting up of our hands, but also in the lifting up of our offerings. Also, if you have the envelope box, there are... A leadership conference special offerings in there, and I know we're not having one this year, but you can also contribute to it. We will be doing quite a bit next year if the Lord's willing. And then also, uh, if you're not using envelopes for checks, we do encourage you to use our kiosks and, uh, and to give because God uh, encourages us to give cheerfully and generously. And, and if you know in the times in which we live, so many people are suffering in so many different ways, and God has extremely blessed us. So let's, let's express our gratitude, show our appreciation by giving, because when you give, it's not just giving the First Baptist Church here on 10600 Watterson Trail, but the gospel goes not only through our streaming live, but as I shared before, uh, we get emails from people across the globe uh, that says that they appreciate our services and the word that go, uh, goes by way of radio and other venues. So we're grateful. So every time you give, you are investing in the lives of somebody else's salvation and somebody else's uh, spiritual growth and development. So we thank you. Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for the opportunity to give cheerfully and to give generously. According to your word, you said, bring you all the tithes into the storehouse that there might be meat in your house and to prove you. Herewith now said the Lord of hosts, if you not pour out unto us the windows of heaven, uh, that we won't have room enough to receive. And so God, we ask your blessings upon the offering. We pray your blessings upon the gift and the giver and the spirit in which it is given. And then God, as we depart from this place, help us to go to our classes and uh, continue our fellowship, uh, bonding together as one uh, body in Christ, learning and growing together so that we might fulfill the great commission that you've given us through your son, Jesus Christ. And then I pray that when we depart from this place, may we never depart from your presence, but may you keep us in perfect peace and let us learn how to live life happily, God, whatever we're experiencing and whatever day it might be. Now unto him that is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before his throne with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, dominion, power, and majesty, both now and forever. Let the believing heart say, amen, amen, amen. Father, in the direction of our ushers in the rear, amen. Let's see y'all. Uh... 